Thank you so much for tuning in to episode six of the Farm One podcast. My name is Ina Tubaleha, Chief of Staff on the team, and joined with me, we have... Uh, I'm Rob Lang. I'm the CEO and founder of Farm One. And I'm Michael Chin, Vice President of Corporate Development. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you all doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's uh, I, I've got a good view out of my window now, so I can see the gray day outside in New York <laughs> City. <laughs> but yeah, pretty good. How about you, Doing Michael? Great. Doing great. Awesome. Thanks. How about you? Um, not not too bad. This is a different setting that we typically record in, so I'm feeling a little bit a little bit different. But I'm glad to be here today. Um, so today we're going to be talking through a little bit of news. We're going to start off with our new segment. So Renewable, which is a New York City based company, just raised $1.1 million in seed funding. Michael, can you share a little bit about who Renewable is and why this news is a little bit exciting for you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ina. So Renewable, based in New York City, uh, and that's R-E-N-U-B-L-E. -E. Um, they announced they raised, as you said, the 1.1 million. And what they're doing is uh, they've developed some solutions, and, and I think it's uh, technology-based, um, where they turn food waste um, uh, into a way to grow more food. So essentially what they're doing is they're taking food waste running it through whatever process they've developed to extract the nutrients out of it. Um, so they're calling it, uh, they upcycle organic compounds from unrecoverable vegetable waste. Um, here's where it gets really interesting for Farm One and for our industry. Um, and what they're doing with those nutrients that they're extracting out of the waste is they're turning it into, into water-soluble organic hydroponic nutri nutrients. Um, for farms like us. So this is amazing. I think this is awesome. What they're looking to do is to create a closed loop system uh, within the, uh, the industry uh, where we're uh, using as much of the nutrients out of the food as possible. Um, and they're able to do this until they get to the point where there's nothing left, right, for them to, to extract. And you're, I'm assuming, left with uh, some form of uh, what was a vegetable. Uh, that uh, is uh, able to then be processed in, in, in its natural ways. So um, I think there are a lot of implications to this. Rob, um, sort of first take, uh, what do you think of, of, of a business like this and a technology like this? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd say I'm really happy that Tania has managed to raise some money. You know, I've known her for a little while, not super well, but she's on the uh, New York City urban ag scene and she's been you know building this company and trying to do that by herself and so it's it's great to see her getting some money for this and I think that the underlying principle is great you know this idea that we can take um, some of these kind of unrecoverable food scraps uh, and food waste and turn them into something that's beneficial uh, for hydroponic nutrients that's fantastic I think that if you look overall at the sourcing of hydroponic nutrients, there's probably not enough examination of where people are getting their nutrients from. Um, and so this idea that you can create more of a circular economy, you can repurpose food waste, um, and you can do that maybe, you know, even within the same local area is fantastic. So, so overall, like really excited about it um, and happy to dive into all, of, all the other areas of food waste and all the complexities there as well, but uh, overall exciting. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, right? Because this, I, they talk about in, in in this article, they talk about some of the challenges um, they've had in in educating investors uh, about why this is important, why this is interesting, which kind of surprises me, given all of the attention given to ag tech and food tech this these days. We've talked a lot uh, on this podcast about. Um, the, the capital that's going in. It seems like it's maybe a little bit of a blind spot right now with the industry. Um, but the other part of it too is the complexity around um, the way we handle food waste right now and waste in general in our system. You know, every municipality seems to be different. Every county seems to be different. Every state, um, you know, and, and uh, certainly there, I don't know if there are federal sort of uh, uh, if there's any federal infrastructure to it at all. Um, but that does seem to be a big part of the challenge in uh, by local areas, you said. 
Yeah, you know, food waste is an issue that I, I think as consumers, you kind of hear about it every so often and you feel guilty, right? Like, because you hear numbers like, oh, 40% of the food, you know, grown and, and distributed in the US is eventually wasted, which is a huge amount of food. Uh, and as a consumer, I think we're all familiar with buying, you know, a bag of spinach and then it sits in the back of your fridge, it gets soggy and you go like, oh, okay, I can't really use that now. Or you see a pepper sort of starting to go a little bit soft and... And I personally, I've you know done quite a few projects to do with food waste with um, you know various companies trying to figure out how we can get consumers to maybe waste less food, and also trying to look at the supply chain, the distribution, all that kind of stuff to see if there's a areas to reduce food waste. And I think that um, you know it 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 is actually quite a complex area when you look at it. It is something where. Um, the instinct to shame consumers is probably unwise um, because as consumers, we have only a certain amount of power um, to, to do what we want with our food. Um, but I would say, you know, to look at the overall picture, right, you can sort of imagine um, a time scale from planting a seed all the way through to consumption or disposal at the end on the consumer side. In America, we tend to be, you know, pretty good actually at, at um, efficiently using food and, and um, dealing with it on the agricultural side. So there isn't a lot of food waste anymore on the agricultural side. If you compare that to quite a few developing countries, there still is quite a lot of waste there because they don't have access to great storage techniques. They don't have access to the advanced logis logistics infrastructure like refrigerated trucking, that kind of thing. So you'll still see a lot of food waste at that agricultural end. But in the, in the US, we're pretty good there. We tend to start to waste more and more the closer it gets to the consumer. And so there's still problems with logistics in the US. So if you take something like strawberries, uh, I think we've all had this experience where we buy strawberries that look pretty good on the shelf and then two days later they've, they're have moldy and then you uncover and actually the top ones are all right, but all down the bottom, it's all covered in gray mold. So that's a problem often with temperature fluctuation, you know, in the cold chain. So something like a strawberry might be the same age as another strawberry, but it's been through temperature fluctuation. And so it's more susceptible uh, to problems as opposed to something that's had a consistent temperature uh, through the cold chain. You know, take that example a bit further and you can say, oh, look, there's now this other way of growing strawberries, right? We could grow indoors under artificial light, pesticide free, very close to the customer. Something like Oishi Berry is doing, something like Plenty and Driscoll's have talked about doing. We'll see what happens with that one. Um, but that solves a lot of this logistics issue because you can grow something, make sure that it's stored only for maybe a day or so before it ends up on a shelf. So you've reduced that time. Um, and then you get a better looking product, a more attractive product for the consumer, they're less likely to waste it. There are other issues that happen, obviously, when we get to products that enter the hospitality industry. And so if you look at food waste within restaurants, hotels, etc., if you think about the classic like Las Vegas buffet, right, that is on the one hand, that is a repurposing of food in, in a bad way. You know, it might have had some more expensive items that end up in the buffet, but also it's a demonstration that's very visible to people like, oh, look at all this food that actually is probably gonna have to get thrown out at the end of the day because it, it's not safe anymore to consume. And I think that's one of the places where we confront that as consumers. Um, and, and in hospitality, I think that a lot of the drive to reduce waste is more about cost saving than environmental saving. And so, um, you know, there are ways that people can track food waste in the industry. There's a company called Lean Path that offers a really good system where you can actually weigh, photograph and categorize your food waste. And if it's built into a kitchen infrastructure, it can be, you know, really effective, actually. And if you look at, um, for instance, companies like Google, uh, I think IKEA is a Lean Path user as well. They, they're very, very large sort of um, creators of, of food because they have to feed all their staff. IKEA feeds all their um, customers as we talked about last week. So if you can in integrate a system like LeanPath into something like that, you can actually start to target and understand what are you wasting and when. So for instance, you might realize, oh, I'm using a lot of orange peel because I've been making orange juice. Okay, is there something else we could do with the orange peel that is a bit more thoughtful and then and prepared in advance that is gonna allow us to waste less? So those systems are great, but ultimately, you know, so many restaurants in New York City, so many restaurants in, in other cities, so many hotels, so many food service establishments, there's still a ton of waste, you know, and as much as you can try to repurpose some of that, if you look at, you know, Baldor, for instance, has this scrap, uh, 
Sparks program, which is scraps spelt backwards. They, they don't talk about food waste. They've culturally sort of said, we're not going to waste food. They try to repurpose into soups and sauces and all that stuff. But there's still a limit. You know, if, if um, a peach falls on the floor, uh, you can't serve that to a customer, right? <laughs> but you can repurpose and try to take those nutrients. And so long story ending here, <laughs> um, Renewable is trying to capture that, that sort of last mile of, of food waste. And so what's really exciting is that through, you know, technologies like biodigestions, like composting technologies, things like that, you can then say, okay, I'm going to extract those nutrients, those things that we've put so much effort, money, time, carbon emissions into, and try to turn that back into something that can be useful in hydroponics. And so, so that's, that's why this sort of thing is exciting. But, it, but of course, it, it's one part of that whole food waste uh, kind of picture. Rob, there's something that you shared that is really resonating with me, how Baldor doesn't even call it scraps. Yeah. What do they call it? <laughs> sparks. It's scraps spelt well, backwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sparks. Yeah. Because there is a there's a negative connotation with the food with, with the with the word food waste. Um and yeah. it it all that really means is that we can't consumers can't use it anymore, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. So yeah. I'm really yeah. excited about the work that Renewable is doing is because it's turning, it's taking that negative connotation away from food waste and turning it into an asset because it's not just, just because it can't be used by or consumed by us doesn't mean that it's unusable. So I'm really excited to be in this world where we're reframing what we consider something wasteful. Yeah, and you know, if you think about it in a biggest perspective, if you think about the circular economy, right? What we're trying to do with the circular economy is we're trying to keep valuable things within the ecosystem. You know, in New York City, for instance, like we spend all this money trying to get this food, which is sort of now nutrients are coming into New York City. And then if you just put them in landfill, what's gonna happen is that food is gonna decompose and it's gonna produce methane gas, which is one of the most harmful greenhouse gases and you're essentially losing all those nutrients whereas if you can keep them in the system and traditionally that's with composting and that's great and i don't want to no one should stop composting but like you can keep compost you can keep those nutrients within the city that's great and then renewable is this other way to keep food nutrients within uh within the system and that and that's fantastic too yeah and to connect the two points there you know if you're if the burden is on the consumer to try to solve this problem and the guilt is on the consumer at the, at the very end of that time scale, that very end of the chain, that's a pretty heavy burden, right? Because I'm going to a restaurant, I'm saying, okay, well, I just, I, I, I've got some leftovers, you know, give me a container right? So that I can take this home. <laughs> I want to have this to go. I'm not wasting it. I'm a, but then meanwhile, you've got, you know, the plastic and everything else. And that's just a lot. I'm just, you know, I just want to have a good meal. I'm just out to have dinner, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and to your point, sort of, okay, well, how does the industry or the system sort of account for that in better ways, you know, whether it's renewable with composting, you know, on their website, they've, um, they put up a bunch of data points, which I thought were really interesting. Um, we talked about water, you know, they're saying that um, the, the water that they um, required to produce food that we purchase comprises roughly 50% of our total water footprint. I've seen studies where 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture in the world. Um, and we know that that's a resource that uh, we're seeing the effects of that usage out in California right now directly. Um, yeah. With food waste in, in major landfills, uh, they're citing that 13% of greenhouse gases produced in the U.S. can be traced uh, to growing, manufacturing, and transporting and disposal of food. Um, so, you know, within these landfills. And so when you think about that, okay, can we capture that, that methane gas? Can we use that as energy down the road? How complicated is that? What sort of infrastructure is needed there? So hopefully that becomes part of the discussion um, and, you know, they also cite that food waste accounts for nearly 32% of household waste for most American homes. That accounts to uh, almost $2,000 a year per household, which, you know, as we're seeing right now during the pandemic, that's a lot of money, you know, for, for a lot of average households. So, um, yeah. I know you, yeah. you did a present. Oh, sorry. 
I know you did a presentation um, last night with uh, Zero Waste NYC. Um, what, what was that discussion about? What was the workshop about that you did? Yeah, so Zero Waste NYC, they host monthly workshops to talk about how we can, what we can do in our daily lives to make more sustainable decisions. And the workshop that Farm One sponsored last night was all about food and how do we create a collective sustainable food system. And it was a great opportunity to be able to connect and learn from other folks in the zero waste community that are really hyper aware of what their contributions are to their, you know, what their carbon footprint is and how they make food decisions. And one of the biggest takeaways that I got from that event is that the problem is so much bigger than what's in our individual control, that we have to, we, we can we can make a small decision, you know, I'm going to make a swap for this one one piece of produce for something that's not wrapped and I'm going to choose to purchase something differently, but there's still so much more happening beyond what we can see and what's in our control. So we have to just start from somewhere, you know, it's just because the problem is much bigger than ourselves. So it doesn't mean that we can't contribute to a solution. So I'm really excited that I was able to learn so much from the other panelists at the event. And I'm currently just still digesting all the things that I learned. And I'll be writing about some of the, the things that I'm gonna be changing now from what I've learned at that workshop. Nice, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that I share a lot of the sentiment around sustainability issues, like you sort of, it seems like such an intractable problem. And then you say, okay, well, there's some things I can do as a consumer, but but I think that the that there is a sort of push to, to shame consumers to and, and to also try to suggest that just changing consumer behavior is the way to solve all this. And it's like, no, that's not it. We have to really look at these systems. We have to really rebuild things from the ground up. And, and also I think like one of the, you know, big parts of that is starting to account whether financially, whether in other ways for the waste that is produced, you know, someone sort of has to pay for that. Someone has to figure out how to recapture that. And I think some burden of that has to fall on food producers, you know, some of it has to fall on retailers um, so that consumers aren't sort of shouldered with this immense responsibility um, to, to fix it, you know, and, and I guess the, the other thing I wanted to sort of mention on that was that I think that, you know, food waste is often sort of um, described in terms of weight, you know, 10 pounds of carrots, 10 pounds of meat, 10, you know, and, and I think we also have to just remember that a lot of those things are not exactly equivalent. You know, Michael mentioned water. If you're, if you're taking produce that's being grown in California, which is an extremely water scarce um, state now because of the burden of agriculture, you're essentially taking water from that state. So that, that food waste of a product that's grown there may be much more significant in terms of environmental cost compared to something produced in New York state um, that where maybe water isn't so scarce or maybe, you know, the water usage wasn't uh, quite so critical. And so, um, you know, giving giving weight to those, giving weight, I guess, <laughs> giving weight to those things, um, I think is really important. And it, it sort of brings us back to this point about indoor agriculture and the ability to grow right next to a city and often using a water source that is much more contained, uh, saving a lot more water and saving water compared to other, um, you know, places where something is a little bit more scarce. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's my, I could go, I could talk about this forever. So I have to just like stop, I think. <laughs> well, that's, a, I think that's a perfect way to sort of transition to our, our next segment on the podcast. Um, you know, we're one of the things I find so interesting about what we're doing um, is, you know, the way that we think about distributed farms uh, in highly populated areas in urban areas, you know, outside, slightly outside of urban areas. Um, and we've been working with uh, the team over at Urban Produce, uh, who are going to be our guests uh, on, on this week's podcast. So really excited to talk about what they're doing in Chicago and, and, and all that. Yeah, let's do it. You're going to see a visual transition where we move into <laughs> other places for this interview. Uh, I'm excited. Hi, Barry and Alicia. So great to have you guys on the podcast. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, a few months ago, I guess, probably around midsummer or, or so, 
um, we were talking about uh, working with farmers, working with independent urban farmers. And I think this really sort of came off of uh, uh, some of what was happening with um, uh, George, George Floyd and, and some of the protests. And we were, as, as Farm One, particularly interested in uh, what was happening with uh, urban farms and uh, particularly urban farms uh, and people of color and, and communities uh, uh, that were being underserved and all of that. And so um, Alicia reached out to us on, on Instagram and uh, we got to know her and we got to know Barry and we got to know all of the great things that they're doing in Chicago with urban produce. Um, and uh, we're really excited to have them on today's podcast so that we can share the story because it's fascinating and it, it's, it's really brilliant and amazing what, what they've been building there over the years. And I feel like with every conversation we have with them, um, we, we just, as we dig deeper, we learn more and uh, just get more and more excited about what they're working on. So welcome, guys. Um, why don't we start with introductions? Um, Barry, if, if, if you want to sort of introduce yourself and then maybe Alicia, you can, uh, you can introduce yourself. Just talk about, you know, what you do and, and your background and, and, and all of that. That'd be great. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, appreciate you guys having us. It's kind of fun. Um, farming 21st century, you do podcasts. Go, who figure? Go figure. Um, now, so Barry Howard, the founder, uh, one of the co-owners and founders of uh, Urban Produce, I come from a real estate development background. And so some of the impetus of the farm coming together was using that background um, intersected with a, a neighborhood in Chicago that has a lot of vacant land, which obviously is needed for farming, and combining uh, my passion for gardening to take it to the next level of farming. Uh, so I got things kind of momentum going, but I, I needed a, a team. And so Alicia greatly joined us about 18, uh, two years ago now, gosh, um, two years ago now and really take it over the day-to-day -day operations. So i um, hand it off to her. Oh, my turn. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for having us. This is amazing. As you guys know, I've always um, been a huge fan of Farm One. Uh, so as Barry said, um, I'm one of the co-owners, but it didn't start that way. Um, I started off as a greenhouse manager at Urban Produce. And um, so, yeah, my role has definitely grown um, in the last two years. Uh, my background, uh, I'm a scientist by, uh, my background is in science, uh, molecular biology. Uh, so I did a lot of genetics work and uh, I was finishing a master's program and I was looking to do something um, kind of untraditional with my degree instead of going into academia. And so I was just looking, you know, for cool opportunities, but there was one right around the corner from my house. Uh, and I came, I stumbled along just walking my dogs and, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> and now we're two years in and it is like, we, we are going at a, a fast speed here. <laughs> Wow, that's great. So, how did so did you how did you guys meet? What was the initial interaction, and and what was that like? I mean, were you just like, wow, what are you doing with uh, <laughs> you're growing stuff yeah. out here, Barry? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Well, the the story was that we had a greenhouse manager before who got a great opportunity at another urban farm. I mean, some of our initiative is obviously getting skill sets and training. Um, in Chicago. So she had a great, you know, promotion essentially to run a, a, a different farm. And so um, I had a freak out moment for about two weeks where how are you going to find someone to operate a greenhouse that knows um, farming in the city of Chicago. And so serendipitously, um, Alicia happened to live around the corner, walked her dog and had run into Victoria was her name um, and had just kind of been curious about it. And she was in her last stages of her, you know, master's program. And so I think was really kicking around what next steps she could do and just happened to start volunteering. And at that point, uh, Victoria got the other job offer was on her way. And so we in quick succession said, okay, we got to make this work, you know, finish your paperwork and we need you to start as soon as possible. So it was really um, a little bit of just, you know, serendipitous, like that's how things happen. And I don't even dread anymore what would have happened if we didn't find Alicia, because I'm not sure how you can get someone to run a 4,000 square foot, green, you know, rear round greenhouse and then a big expansion um, without someone with her both you know, scientific and, and botany background, but also just the entrepreneurial spirit to say, hey, we don't have a, a roadmap here. We got to just figure this out. So she's doing a great job of making decisions and pushing this uh, enterprise along. 
Yes, so Alicia, you jumped from the fast-paced world of academia (laughs) (laughs) right into the slow-paced world of urban farming. Oh, yeah, it's so slow. (laughs) No, it's so fast. (laughs) It's been fun. Yeah, so what was that? What was the what was it like? What was the first few weeks for you like there? And you're just jumping right into that where it's just like you know, you're Yeah, you're- I have to give all the credit to Victoria, who was the previous uh greenhouse manager. She set up systems um that I was just able to slide into. Um and those systems were so well established that I was able to poke holes and fill gaps. And so that's what kind of aided to our, the success that we're seeing today is because of the foundation um, and the work that she put in in the first um, years of Urban's um, conception. So yeah, so just after learning the bit, that allowed me to learn the business because like I said, I was in grad school. So I was just doing research nonstop you know, for the last two years. And so now I have to learn how to do sales. I have to learn how to um, to grow <laughs> and uh, keep up with demand. And so it was a huge learning curve. Um, and really I had, what what was it like two months to learn Barry <laughs> before, Until, yeah. she, <laughs> before she ended up starting her new job. So yeah, that's how everything just kind of got started. And so maybe for the benefit of people listening and watching, um, it'd be great if you could just describe what does Herban do and, and what is your situation? I remember you giving us this great virtual tour back in the summer and it felt like every minute you were like, okay, and we're going to go around this corner and there's a whole nother thing. So tell us, you know, where are you? What do you guys do and what kind of space do you occupy? You want to take that, Barry? Uh, okay. Uh, um, so yeah, the, it's been an interesting evolution. The The original proof of concept was just to see if urban ag had legs. So again, I was using that real estate background where we wanted to do, instead of doing full bore the whole kit and caboodle, we just wanted to make sure that there was an audience for it, that we could figure out the technical side of it. And then again, um, what Leisha was talking about with when she came on board, some of the challenges in urban farming is just that you not only have the farming component, but you have all these other extra layers of permitting of um, not a skilled, you know, labor pool that knows farming that well, and then just charting against really big agribusiness, you know, how do we find a niche there, you know, being where we're at. So we started with a year round greenhouse. Um, that was our proof of concept to make sure it worked. Well, we, we built it and we realized that it, it worked and we had a great audience for it, but it didn't have the scale to be self-sustaining. And so our goal was never to be a grant based or um, nonprofit necessarily that would, you know, use external funds that way to survive. We knew that we needed to be uh, much more entrepreneurial and I hate to say capitalistic where we had to get revenue from different areas. So we decided that um, there was some other space in the area um, adjacent to our current land. So we spent several years consolidating and uh, acquiring different parcels to piece together you know, what's now the farm. So the farm now has its original 4,000 square foot greenhouse. We have a outdoor kind of event space that started off as um, really an area that we were doing for educational programs and some limited events. And now just this last summer, we completed our, our major expansion, which is uh, in-ground agriculture, um, which is its own challenges in, 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 in urban environment, uh, A-frame channels, which is a kind of low-tech version of vertical agriculture, where it's a A-frame with running basically um, gutter support systems. Uh, and then uh, I guess that's the two main areas. Then we also have uh, a orchard area to try to bring in some different variety of, of fruits in, uh, to the area. And then finally a prairie space. Uh, we used a, what's called a bioswale, all of the ex- excess water that would run off during a, a rain to our outdoor in ground could flow into a bioswale that was good for stormwater retention, but then also allowed us um, to diversify our crops where we could sell like this beautiful aster behind me. We could sell uh, cut flowers, do uh, seedlings and stuff like that for people that want to garden. So it was a nice complement to our produce uh, produce program um, that allowed us to kind of attract a, a wider net of people that were also interested in gardening. Very cool. And oh, oh, sorry. Go on, Ina. Yeah. Thanks for sharing a little bit about how, you know, urban produce got started and a little bit of the story of how you grew from just a greenhouse operation to what you have now with all the different diversity in um, growing methods. 
Can you share a little bit more about how you were all received in the Chicago community and in the urban farming community in Chicago? Good you, Alicia. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say the immediate neighborhood, there was a lot of curiosity that was tied to the farm. So it, it was a lot of, okay, what is this? What are you guys doing? What are you guys growing? And I think we have established a really strong um, relationship with our neighbors over the last years, and they really have become advocates of what we do. Um, so um, Barry was really smart at really establishing um, strong connections with all the local businesses. So we have a really strong connection with the food pantry that is around the corner. And because of that, now we donate to them on a regular basis, and they have really become a part of our operation and our mission as to, you know, uh, give, always giving back. Um, the local community is really excited about having this, this fresh food option. And so it became a, a challenge of, okay, how do we essentially pay the bills? Because we know you just can't um, operate off of giving everything away. So it was this delicate balance of being able to pay the bills, but also being able to give back and become a really, uh, an, um, an, um, I don't know, like a, a um, what, what word am I looking for? I don't know. A Profitable business. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's, that's one of the challenges. I mean, it's I really mean, what it is. <laughs> Yeah, I hate to cut you off there, but one of the challenges we Not see with Meg is there is kind of this almost like you get bucketed either, hey, this novelty, almost like feel good um, community garden. But we realized if we went that path, that there'd be a lot of challenges long term, whether you have the same overhead and tax bills and, and labor costs of an of a ongoing other business that we can't just be this feel good thing. So some of the delicate balance we feel out early, and I, I give out compliments to Alicia, is like, how do we get this out there to the greater Chicago market? Chicago's got such a good food scene. Obviously with COVID, it's been, you know, majorly impacted this year, but we have a really good um, restaurant and, and food, you know, industry that people get into. And that translates also to people at home. So this year we were able to pivot from traditionally restaurant sales to direct to customer because those same people that were eating at restaurants that understood the quality of stuff that we're doing were also the ones that ended up buying for us direct. Um, just to spitball a little bit time is the original question. The, the thing that we had challenged too was how do we get you know direct sales? We don't have a sales force. There's a few of us hanging out. We had a distributor who really had trouble and not in a bad way and I would never ding them. They had trouble figuring out our story as well. So they have all these products and everything like that. Like we were just a piece of the puzzle or at least rightfully so said, hey, I'm gonna start establishing some direct connections with chefs. So we started this Know Your Grower program, which is really a way that we increased our sales to really selling out every week. This year has been different. Now we've pivoted to direct as customers, but last year, and I think we'll go back to it, that chef-based sales is really a great thing of like, how does Chicago receive us? Well, now all of a sudden we brought the farm to the city. And so this idea of that connection to the food, but being able to actually also go visit it, not just talk to the farm or see pictures, but actually be able to go there and walk the site, that took us to the next level in terms of connections with the people that we're working with. Yeah. And then to add to where we fit in in urban ag, so as Barry said before, either urban ag fits into that whole nonprofit urban gardening um, category, or it's millions of dollars that's backing it and, you know, they're getting VC money. So we're kind of somewhere in the middle where we're trying to be a for-profit entity and trying to make it work. So no one really has the answers for us. There isn't really a model for it to make it work. So there has been a lot of um, R&D that has been involved here and try to figure out how to make this business model work in the city of Chicago. Maybe you can talk about just very specifically some of the crops that you grow and some of the customers that you used to sell to and, and sell to now. What does that really look like? So um, in the beginning years, we were just a, a hydroponic greenhouse. So we grew six varieties of lettuce um, and we kind of experimented with microgreens. Um, it really didn't have much success there. but um, we were able to establish relationships with about 10 restaurant partners at that time, um, which was pretty cool because this 4,000 square foot footprint, you know, really helped to, we had a real business model. We could have been, it could have been self-sustaining if we made it work. Um, after the expansion, um, so last year was our first real season, our first full season, we grew 70 different varieties. 
and um, our restaurant partners dwindled at maybe two or three. So <laughs> there was a great change in um, the demand for fresh local food. So what we seen was that a lot of our restaurant partners are pivoting to, you know, a lot of um, distributors where they can get food at a cheaper price point. And so it really hurt small producers like us. And so um, that's why we decided to pivot to a direct to uh, consumer model, because at the same time, there was the shift in um, society where people were paying attention to what was going into their body because we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so now health and wellness was like at the forefront of everyone's mind. So. And how is that process as a team? You know, it, you know, because for us, I, I remember it was like beginning of March and we started to realize like, oh, this is a really serious thing. And, and as a team, you know, it was obviously lots and lots of conversations and trying to figure out like what to do. How does it work? You know, how do you operate as a company and as a team and who makes decisions and and how does that all work? Yeah, so at the time it was just Barry and I. So it was just a lot of phone calls between us. So his, um, with what he does for um, a living, <laughs> he was projecting, he said, oh, oh, Alicia, I think this is serious. You're gonna start, you're gonna start seeing some cancellations. And I call it doomsday because we were packing for orders. And just as he had said that, I started getting text message after text message from all the chefs saying, sorry, we have to cancel indefinitely. And I'm like, oh my God, like what's happening? And then next week was the complete shutdown. So you had no time to process um, what just happened. <laughs> and so um, we just immediately started talking about ways in which we could pivot. But at the same time, um, there was a silver lining in it all um, because we were coming up against this, you know, big expansion. So it was nice to have the time to pause and plan for what we were going to, um, you know, experience in the future, how we were going to operate in the future. So. Yeah, Barry, how does it, oh, sorry. I was going to ask like how Barry saw it from his perspective as well. And, and you know, obviously, being part of the real estate world as well, how it affects you and what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, that's a kind of a loaded question. I'll keep right. brief. Uh, <laughs> go on forever about that one. Um, no, I, I think that we, I, I do give us credit for being nimble and I think any small producer has to realize that there's going to be certain things you can control and certain things like a pandemic you can't. And so we had some stressful nights and stuff we thought about, but then we had to, you know, level heads prevail. And we said, wait a minute, we have a great audience that was already buying our produce through the restaurants the restaurants is not an option. Let's figure out a way to just go around the restaurant for the near term and go direct to consumer. So like, like Alicia said, we did have about two months there where we ramped up, got their outdoor growing going. And that gave us the amount of time to pivot to our, we called it market box. We got a little worried about community supported agriculture. That's, you know, a term that's more commonly used, but we wanted to rebrand a little better. So we said, Hey, we're going to do a market box. And so the market box was our following basically a Midwest you know, farming season where what, as things come, you know, ripe and mature, we put it in the box that week. And, and so people would sign up for essentially a subscription and, and we were able to put, um, you know, our produce that we were growing in there. And one of the really creative things I, I'll give Galicia credit for is then we started saying, wait a minute, there's all these other producers in the same bucket as we are. They're trying to figure out who their audience is. Maybe we can be a consolidator of some of their products as well. So by the end of the summer, we were supplementing things and now we're doing through our winter season aggregating different small producers into a market box where we can go direct to customer and not have the overhead of everyone having their own sales force and everyone worry about their own marketing and stuff. We could maybe basically use economies of scale by aggregating together. And that's going to you know solve us in the near term. Yeah. And you guys have built a really terrific brand out there. What, uh, what, I, I guess, you know, when you switched from working with, with restaurants into this direct to consumer model, you know, what were the things that went into that? How, what went into building that brand? How did you get the word out to people? Well, I credit farms like you guys, Farm One. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you guys know I've been kind of peeking through the bushes for years. And so one thing I noticed is that you guys had really cool branding. And so we knew that was going to be a differentiator for us. So to have a really clean website, to engage our followers on social media were two key um, parts to us growing our operation. So um, 
I will say like we really honed in on what we look like um, to our consumer and really getting our mission out there and what we were doing. And as a result of that, we really have um, engaged our followers and they really have bought in. And so just, it's almost to the point of whatever we put out there, they want to support it. They want to support it. So they, and, that, and that's an amazing thing to have that much buy-in where whatever you create, they know that it's, it's for a good cause or it's going to, you know, help to support this farm that's in the middle of the West side of Chicago. So they're like, whatever you do, sign me up. I'm, 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 I'm ready for it. So it was great. Well, I'm going to cut you off. Box. Okay. You're, so, you're, you're, so, you're selling yourself short as an excellent grower. I will yeah. obviously say when you're shipping stuff from California, it's, it's a week and a half old. It's noticeable difference. It's tasteful difference. So people are supporting the cause, but the underlying foundations always, we have the best produce. It's so yes. good. It's taste. It's right there. So there's a, it's a duality, not just to support us. Sorry, I cut you off rudely. No, but I don't want you to understand great. your ability to, <laughs> to grow. Cause that's the biggest yes. part. If we, if we had terrible produce, well, we'd be shut down by now. So yeah. we do always want to have the highest quality produce as well. Yeah, that's like one of the greatest feed, uh, the greatest feedback that we get we got from not only our our consumers, our direct our people at home, but from our restaurant partners. And so there was this stigma of hydroponic lettuce um, that existed in the uh, in the chef world. And so a lot of them wouldn't even take meetings with me. And I'm like, well, no, our lettuce is different. Just give me a chance. And so I would go in. And they would, you know, break leaves, smell it, taste it. And I'm like, each of our lettuces has a different flavor profile. And they didn't believe me until they actually experienced it. So Barry's right. We do have the best um, produce because we really pay attention to the foundation. So the soil, um, the water and the nutrient quality. We really do spend a lot of money making sure that we have the best growing environments for our crops. Yeah, it can be really surprising, right? I mean, you were you, when you gave us the tour. I mean, we were all sort of really blown away by um, you know just the space itself, what you've developed, um, all of the outdoor, out, outdoor beds that, that you walked us through. Um, one of the things that I, I thought was really cool was uh, you've got some fruit trees, and you talked a lot about the native varieties. How do you decide what varieties you know you want to grow and what you want to offer? I mean, seventy. So one of the things people get really surprised about when we talk about the varieties that we grow, it's sort of, you know, at least pre-COVID when we were working with chefs, you know, it was like 100, 150, 200 different varieties at any one time, which in ag is sort of like, what? That's nuts, right? Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about what you're growing and and how you guys have come to the, the, choose the crops that, that, that you're offering and growing and what you've learned from that process. Yeah, so for us, biodiversity was really important. And so I think as a small producer, especially in an urban environment, um, being able to diversify your crops is really important, especially we know like in agriculture, it's all about monoculture, right? We Every farmer produces one type of crop, they do it well, they've been doing it for generations. And so it's fun to be able to experiment with a lot of crops um, and be able to educate the consumer on, hey, this crop is from this place. It um, There are different varieties of eggplant. Hey, you know, <laughs> so it's been really fun to add diversity. But um, with our farm, it wasn't just about the crops, but it was also about adding the orchard and the native crops that were um, that to also add to that um, diversity. And I'll, Barry is really passionate about um, all the native crops, so I'm gonna let him. <laughs> I'm gonna let him chime in at this point. <laughs> oh come on! Uh, no, no um, you love it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, stepping back to the idea of urban ag, um, we're filling in an area that has essentially been vacant for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So we're actually. I mean, going to the earlier comments of the civil unrest this summer. The Madison Avenue between California and Kedzie was essentially, you know, at riots and stuff in the late 60s. A lot of the area then, you know, emptied out. So this has been an area that's seen some, you know, population otherwise decline. I got another preface. That's kind of the preface. I want to start, though, that we don't want a feel-good story. We're not, I mean, we want a feel-good story. We don't want to feel bad for a story. 
we want to come out with the best crops, the best area, this and that. But I want to give some context of where we're at. But with all of this kind of hollowing out of the neighborhood, you lost a lot of you know great green space, you lot of lost of tree cover and other people that are taking care of their their land. So what we thought of is thinking of urban ag as like an ecosystem that you have your ag components, but really let's bring some other elements that would not only maybe bring some future revenue, but make the space more interesting, and aesthetically beautiful. We want to be a destination. So we added a lot of native trees. Um, I'm a huge white oak fan, 500 different types of caterpillars live on them. It's great for bird species that come. And now you have this kind of interactive thing that's your crops, but also these other um, plant species that are on the property. So we also did a very native uh, prairie, like I said, for the bioswale. So it had to be creative where um, I also, I, I think of it almost like we want to have all these things. So you're going to have pest management and stuff, but let's have some beautiful other plants there that really round this whole space out. And so uh, I won't go on my half hour native plant thing, but it really does in my mind, enhance the area and helps create a little bit of integrated pest management with it. And then also gives you a lot of different revenue that you can do. Like we're eventually going to do willows. You can do cut willows. We do cut flowers, cut grasses, um, fresh grasses and stuff that are all again, part of this aesthetic of being at the farm. And I almost think of it as like a, a rural aesthetic. But that's the juxtaposition being in the city, but you see these trees and this prairie and stuff and a farm, but obviously you zoom out and there's the skyline of Chicago. Um, so I think that the idea was not just to make this, this monoculture where maybe industrial ag and people are, you know, a little bit reacting against and make this a true ecosystem of crops and native plants and, and see what kind of interesting things come out of that. So there's not a definite destination for it, but we're kind of going through the process and having fun with it now. Yeah. A lot of the themes that you were talking about in terms of biodiversity and trying the different varieties of eggplant that really resonates with me with some of the experiences that I had on tours also and sharing these with our tour guests. Alicia, what is the most favorite crop that you're excited to share with people or with guests or, you know, what is the most favorite one that, you know, that you have and why? This past grow season, it was a Malabar spinach. <laughs> Whoa, okay. because of <laughs> because of the way that it finishes so I would have you know everyone that I took a tour I would have them take a leaf off and I'm like yeah it tastes like spinach right and they're like yeah and then as it finishes it finishes like okra and I'm like it's like slimy they're like yeah this is amazing so it was <laughs> just to see their reaction and then you know explain that it's spinach and yeah, so that was really fun. That was my favorite crop. Um, I would say second favorite was Orac. So I guess I'm liking this whole like, and so um, just the saltiness of it. And I would talk about how it has like sodium, uh, so a, a percentage of sodium content in its leaves. And they're like, yeah, this is amazing. So yeah, those are my two favorite crops uh, this summer. There's the that. scientists All of those, out. <laughs> yeah. the, the flavor nuances that we don't typically notice in the monoculture crops that we have usually available to us yeah that's really fun i think that's what makes us really unique as small producers so we're definitely taking the time to lean into that right now so i'm gonna jump around a little bit as we have um so when you're you were talking about you know bringing your lettuce uh, to educate chefs and that type of thing um you know hopefully all of that starts to come back sooner than later <laughs> for all of us um but I guess it was there a kind of a breakthrough moment for you? I mean, is it about sort of having them experience it? I mean, is there, you know, one of the things we always talk about is that when we brought chefs on and they started tasting and they started experiencing it, it was sort of this snowball effect of it begins to um, inform and, 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 you know, spark some inspiration and creativity in their own dishes and everything. Are you, were you seeing that similarly in Chicago? I mean, what was that experience like? Absolutely. So um, as Barry mentioned before, um, when we were with the distributor, they took me on a food tour or a tour with all the different restaurant partners. And I just realized how that distributor that wasn't on site, wasn't growing, didn't have that same connection with the food. And so um, I was like, yeah, I really have to, I really have to get in front of them and, and tell it from my perspective and not just from the perspective of locale because like Barry said that kind of um has this perception of oh I want to give back to you and we didn't want that we just wanted to be the best 
And so when I got in front of them and said, hey, you know, this is the best um, product. Here it is. Taste it. Experience it. And then come out to the farm. And so then I learned that when I did the original tastings or the original meetup on the actual farm, there was a deeper buy-in. So um, some of our most loyal customers or loyal uh, restaurant partners started when they came on the actual farm, walked the space, got to meet, you know, the employees. They really got to converse with me as we walked. And so now they're like wanting to support us no matter what, not because of, you know, where we are and who we are, but because we're the best at what we do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very much sort of reflected in our experience. Now, you grew up in, in the neighborhood in, in East Garfield Park, is that? Uh... No, I was born on the west side of Chicago. Um, okay. I lived on the west side until I was about six. And then my parents relocated to the south suburbs. Um, but I moved back to East Garfield Park um, once I got married in 2013. So I've been a resident for seven years now. Yeah. So when you when when you saw the uh, the farm and all of that, I'm curious, sort of in the community, how people are responding to it, how they've responded to it, and you know, so when you started with the greenhouse and then now everything that you have and everything that you're planning to build through next year, like how's the how how's the community responded to that? I think the community is really supportive. I told Barry. Um, when I wasn't connected to the farm at all and I would just see structures and gates going up, I would literally stalk the gate in front of the greenhouse to see what updates were coming next. Well, one, because I'm a nerd, but um, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> because I was just so interested to see what the farm was going to do. And so I think um, when we start to incorporate those opportunities for people to co actually come into our space and experience it, not just, you know, for, cause before we were just having um, quarter like parties in our uh, middle garden um, for the first years. But now like with us adding the cafe, they'll be able to come in and then taste more and actually enjoy the space. So I think that's going to be like, that's going to seal the deal with the, with the support that the community will have. So I think that's like been a barrier, but at the same time, we knew we had to solve that issue. So now we're going to break down that barrier because they'll be actually, they'll be able to walk on the space. And so, so what do you have planned for, for this, uh, for next year? You've got the cafe. What, what else? What, what, I guess, you know, hopefully uh, we all come out of COVID in good shape with the vaccine and everything. Uh, what are you guys planning for the next year? Very. Well, uh, so it, it's an interesting thing, the, the evolution of the farm, and I'm sure a lot of the producers go with us, that as our business model evolves, um, I think there's going to be a lot more on-premise consumption with the cafe, and um, that would also enable us with this outdoor space to have more events. I mean, obviously right now is not a very event-friendly time. We used to do a great thing um, called Farm to Turntable. It was a, you know, play on those words, and we bring Chicago House DJs essentially to play the play the farm. Um, we might go back to something like that. Yeah. But I think that the interesting thing is going to be see what really happens on premise. And I think that's one of the, the unique things of having a farm in the city of Chicago is to make a destination people can come. So interesting things, I think probably more similar to what you guys have traditionally done, where you do tours and people come on, do taste testings, that kind of stuff, I think would be a nice next step. Um, we're also adding a farm stay which would be a Airbnb or short-term rental where you can actually rent to over see the farm. You're right there on premise. There's going to be some volunteer opportunities tied into that. So that's kind of another little noodle. Um, and then obviously our, our discussions with you guys and the, the plans we're having for the kind of farm one at urban produce is really a, an interesting thing. Going back to our original farm, you know, we had the, the hydroponic, then we did the in ground, then we had the low tech vertical. And now we're adding on this like, you know, future, futuristic vertical. And so it's going to be an interesting microcosm of different um, growing techniques that you can see in one space. And so we think that's going to, you know, resonate with people that aren't, you know, looking for something in particular, they can get such exposure to so many different growing types, so many different types of crops. And so I think, I don't know exactly where that's going to lead. Um, and it's probably not worth predicting too much yet, but we're <laughs> trying to guide ourselves. But we think there's gonna be a lot of on-premise stuff in the, in the near future here. 
Yeah, so since Barry announced it, uh, for everyone who's listening or watching Oh, I'm this, sorry. Did I, did I preempt that? <laughs> I thought that was maybe a leading question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it was perfect, actually, Barry. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, I, th I thought there was a good hint, maybe, but okay, go ahead. Yeah, so since the summer, we've been working with Barry and Alicia um, to essentially spec out what a indoor vertical farm would be uh, at Urban Produce. Um, so, you know, if all goes well, uh, we're planning, I think, for the fall of next year um, to have a uh, indoor vertical farm at Urban Produce that's going to be powered by Farm One. So the team over here, including Ina and Jess, who are taking point on a lot of the farm design and production side of things, um, are designing the farm right now. We've already chosen, I think, the initial round of uh, Farm One crops that uh, will be growing with Alicia. And um, we'll hopefully start construction, I guess, in the summer and uh, be up and running. Um, and I love that idea, Barry. I, I, I love that you know, on, on a single farm in a city like Chicago, um, you know, you're going to have the full spectrum of everything, of, of outdoor growing, all of the native uh, plants that you guys are working on, that whole experience, the farm stay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, no expert on urban farms and, and models of urban farms all around the, the country and the world, but it, it, it from everything... I mean, it just seems so remarkable, so special, um, and and really unique. So uh, I know everyone over at Farm One's super excited about it, and you just can't wait for this winter to pass. So. It's giving us planning time, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Alicia and Barry, um, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, was, we were able to stare down over Zoom to see if he was going to go first. Uh -oh. That was us looking at each other, partners looking. No, I mean, I, 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 a, I think this is just a great, you know, forum, and, and it's a really interesting to look at where farming's at. Again, going back to the earlier comment that we're talking farm on Zoom. I mean, this is just an interesting space to be at, and I think what you guys are doing, I, I compliment you in the fact that you're reaching out. That the, this, the food market in the U.S. is way too big to be trying to think that we're competition or anything else. That I think this idea of collaboration and let's share ideas and 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 figure out how we can make this better and and, and survive, knowing that those huge agri business out there that again is either community farm or, or giant farms so it's like we're, how do you play the middle space which is i think what traditional you know smaller producers have been how do we figure out that and make a go at it doing not only some good things in, in neighborhoods but having revenue and job support but also just changing the paradigm of how kind of our food systems gotten broken i think this is a good step to getting at least people exposed to the different ways of doing it it doesn't have to be you know giant farms with agribusiness and gmos and all that we can really do farming different and it's you know hopefully inspiring people to look at how farming can be different and and, and using their time money and otherwise to support that yeah thanks barry alicia how about you yeah, I'm just going to add to that and say that, you know, collaboration has been really, really important to Barry and I, especially at, as we have matriculated through this process and trying to figure out how to make this, this model work. So thank you guys for opening up this forum to even have this conversation. This has been great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Rob, is there something that you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to add that we're going to be diving in with a longer conversation with Alicia, uh, just a chance to sort of understand, you know, the life story of someone working in urban ag. And we're hoping to do a bunch of these kind of conversations going forward with Farm One. Um, so if you want to find out more information, more deeper information about herb and produce, uh, we're going to have an extended conversation as well. Um, but yeah, I want to echo, you know, what Barry and Alicia were saying. I think, you know, there's a lots of different ways that people can contribute. Lots of people, uh, you don't need to build huge, huge farms to, to make an impact. And so we're really excited to work with folks like you who are doing cool things and doing it in, you know, unusual ways. That's what's, what's really cool about it. So yeah, back to you, Ina. Well, thank you so much, Alicia and Barry for joining us today. This was a really great conversation and we're really excited to see all the things that come from urban produce in the next year. And we're excited to keep working with you. Awesome. Thanks for the time, guys. Looking forward to the next year together. It's great. I'm going to yeah, get vaccinated and I'm staying. I'm staying at the farm <laughs> stay. <laughs> the whole team's going to have to come over. Where we got yeah. I want that turntable, Barry. <laughs>